Hey everybody, this is John Fenn with churchwithoutwallsinternational.org, all one word, churchwithoutwallsinternational.org, or the shortcut cwowi.org. And here once again talking about are you spirit-filled or have you been spirit-filled? Uh, what is spirit-filled? Because if you grow up in some circles, uh, the subject of being filled with the Holy Spirit can be quite controversial. And we want to look at it from a scriptural standpoint. Aside from everything else, what does Scripture actually say? And, uh, of course, the, the, the primary, the foundational New Testament truth is this. In Acts 2-4, the Holy Spirit came on, the 120, and it says they were all filled with the Spirit and spoke with tongues. And that provides the, the foundational doctrinal experience in the New Testament that, that they spoke with tongues, they were filled with the Spirit, they heard them speak with tongues. This is confirmed, this um, viewpoint, this understanding is confirmed uh, about 10 or 12 years later with Cornelius' household. The question today is, is that the only definition of being Spirit-filled? In Acts 10, 44 through 46, it says this, that the Holy Spirit fell upon those. This is a Roman man's house, Cornelius, and his household who'd gathered to hear Peter and the other Jewish people talk about their Jewish Messiah. And, it's, and when Peter got to the point of Jesus being raised from the dead, uh, it says the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues. And it says this, it says, and many of, as many as were with Peter were astonished because they heard them speak with tongues. And they said, since God has given them the Holy Spirit as he did us, can anybody forbid that they also be water baptized? So there they just, upon hearing, they believed and boom, they received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. But there's that same connection, that same, you know, 10 or 11 years later after the day of Pentecost, it is they were filled with the Spirit and they were speaking in tongues. And, and that Acts 10, 44 through 46. Is that the only definition? Well, you know, it might upset our theology to look at Scripture, but you know what? We need to bend our theology to Scripture rather than trying to make Scripture fit our theology. You know, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 41, remember Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, while she's still, uh, she's coming to visit Mary, or Mary's actually coming to visit her, uh, because Mary's pregnant, she's not married, she goes to, to stay with her cousin Elizabeth, and it says, but Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit upon hearing Mary's voice, Elizabeth, filled with the Spirit, says, blessed are you among women. She's filled with the Spirit. Here, this woman's not even born again, but it says in, in Luke 1:41, she's filled. She's filled with the Spirit and says, Blessed are you among women, for you've been basically chosen to, to, to carry the, the Lord, the Savior. And so we look at that and we think, okay, wow, is, is, there's, there's another thing right there. A woman who's not even born again is filled with the Spirit, but she prophesies, she, she, she exhorts, she comforts, she brings a, a divine word to Mary. Okay, so that's another example of that phrase being filled with the Spirit. Here's another example. In Acts chapter 8, and, uh, excuse me, Acts 4, 8, in Acts 4, 8, Peter and John are in trouble because this lame man has been healed through faith in the name of Jesus. Uh, in fact, they had said through faith in, in Jesus' name, this man stands before you whole, which proves that healing is for today uh, because it was through faith in the name of Jesus. So for healing and tongues and everything to have passed, then also faith in the name of Jesus would have had to have passed. But in Acts 4, 8, when they give their, their defense, it says, Peter filled with the Spirit, spoke with boldness, and he began telling them about Jesus. And later on the passages, if you read 8 through about 12 or 15 there, it says, and on past that, it says that the, the religious leaders were astonished at the eloquence and the boldness and the, uh, the, the eloquence that, the, that Peter spoke with uh, because he was an unlearned and ed uneducated man. So, you know, basically what you have are these religious leaders from academia. You know, they've been to the, the seminary. They've trained and everything. And here's this fisherman there speaking with, with divine eloquence and divine boldness. So that phrase, Peter, filled with the Spirit, spoke boldly and, and, so, and with eloquence. They noted it was with boldness and eloquence. So being filled with the Spirit uh, also can be meaning that you have a divine inspiration. You're, you're filled and anointing, or the old timers might say, the unction came on me, the anointing came on them. And, and they spoke with an eloquence and words that are beyond, the, beyond the, what they would have. Many of you may have had this, where you're talking to a friend or you're witnessing about Jesus and suddenly wisdom starts flowing out of you. And you're thinking, in, your, in your head, you're thinking, wow, I never knew that before. And wow, I never knew that. And you're listening to yourself explain this wisdom and explain scripture that you never learned with your head. That's an example of being filled with the Spirit, just like what we see with Peter in Acts 4.8. There's another example. 
in uh, Acts 4.31, after this incident, after they had uh, reprimanded Peter and John and, and said, don't speak or teach you know, in the name of Jesus anymore, it says um, in about verse 23 that Peter and John went back to their own group. They knew who their own was. They knew who they, who they belonged to. Uh, um, and so they went there and they said, oh God, you're the one who created heavens and earth and, and everything that in them is. Behold the threatenings which they have pre, uh, are, are making against your servants. Now, Father God, you know, they are the ones who crucified your son, Jesus. So now stretch forth your hand to heal and grant that signs and wonders would be done through the name of your holy child, Jesus. And it says the place was shaken. And it says of the whole congregation, they were all filled with the spirit and spoke with boldness as a witness for the things of the Lord. So there's that phrase again, being filled with the spirit it had nothing to do with tongues. Peter being filled with the Spirit had nothing to do with tongues in that Acts 4, 8. It was, it was a matter of eloquence, divine eloquence. Here, the whole congregation is filled with the Spirit and spoke with, wit, with boldness and with a, a strong uh, anointing, um, the witness of the Lord. Uh, we, we go forward to Acts chapter uh, 13 and verses 9 through 11. Paul is speaking and he's confronted by a man named Elamus. Uh, the sorcerer. I, I don't know how Elamus pronounced his, word, uh, his name. That's how I pronounce it. E-L-Y-M-A-S. And he's, pronounced, and, and he's confronting Paul, you know, Elamus the sorcerer. And Paul, it says, filled with the Spirit, says, calls him an evil man and says, for a season darkness is be, going to be upon you. And, and the man became blind right in front of everybody uh, because P Paul, it says, was filled with the Spirit and pronounced a judgment. So a lot of times, you know, we have this term, we, we have this theology that's so set and rigid saying, but, you know, Acts 2, 4 defines it. That is the foundational understanding. There is no doubt. They were filled with the Spirit. They spoke with tongues. It's confirmed 10 years later in Cornelius' household in Acts 10, 44 through 46. They were filled with the Spirit for they heard them speak with tongues. That, there's no doubt with that. But that's not the only evidence of being filled with the Spirit. Elizabeth, filled with the Spirit, prophesied and spoke to Mary. Peter in Acts 4, 8, was filled with the Spirit, spoke with boldness and eloquence that was beyond his education. And, and Paul, speaking filled with the Spirit, spoke a judgment on Elamus the sorcerer. Um, now, they, now the question is like, okay, wow, can, how can this be? Is this, is this a random thing? Many of you have experienced a, a filling of the Spirit. Maybe some people might call it a special faith. Uh, to carry you through difficult circumstances where a, a, a faith and a grace and a peace just comes upon you like a blanket and it carries you through, maybe through a funeral, through a difficult situation, through a family illness, through a, a tight financial situation, and suddenly this peace comes on you, this, this wisdom and this peace and this grace that says, hey, it's going to be okay. You could, you could say that's a, that's a filling of the Spirit. That is a, that, that you're, you have a boldness in a set of circumstances that you would not normally have. It's a God-given thing. Um, but another example is Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 18 through 20. And there Paul says, don't be, don't be saturated with wine, but be saturated with the Spirit. Don't be filled with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And he talks about being filled with the Spirit. There's that phrase again, being filled with the Spirit. How does Paul say you can do this? There's an element there that you can do yourself. And, and there's a way to activate that to flow up from out of your spirit to your soul and to your body. And he says this, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and making melody in your heart to the Lord. If you read the common English Bible of this passage, it says this, don't be filled with wine, which is excessive, but be filled with the Spirit. And I'm going to show you how to do this. Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks in all things. So making melody in your heart is key. A psalm in the first century, a psalm by, by definition in the first century, is a poem set to music accompanied by stringed instruments. Okay, that's what a psalm was. Imagine David playing on his instrument to the Lord. That's, that's provided the foundational um, description and definition of what a psalm is. It's a poem set to music accompanied by a stringed instrument. A hymn in the first century had no instruments at all. It was sung a cappella. And so what Paul is saying is, in psalms, that is with musical accompaniment, in hymns, which is no musical accompaniment, later during the Middle Ages and when organ music, which was the rock and roll of its day, got approved for use in churches, you know, then hymn began to change. It went from the Gregorian chants unaccompanied, you know, acapella to organ music. And so it's changed to that understanding today. 
And then spiritual songs, that's something that comes up out of your heart, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So those are some examples in scripture. And, and the only thing I would say to add to that is say you've had those times where you've probably been filled with the Spirit. Whether you're baptized with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues or not, you may have had times where you've just been filled with the Spirit, with a boldness, with an eloquence, with a, with a divine knowledge of pronunciation that God is going to do that is beyond you. It comes and it goes. It's specifically for that situation. Whereas tongues is an abiding thing and you can work on being filled with the Spirit by praying in tongues regularly and also making melody in your heart to the Lord. Conti keep that continual song going to the Lord so that you can stay in that flow of being filled with the Spirit. Hope this has been a blessing to you today. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.